2 Samuel 11. I'll begin by reading the whole chapter. 2 Samuel 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said to Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst, not go, why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul livest, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. When David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. He made him drunk, and at even went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye, set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent unto David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matter of the war unto the king, and if, it so, if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Know ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech the son of Jerubbesheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he, did, that he died in Thebaz? Why went ye nigh unto the wall? Then say thou, Thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us, and came out unto us into the field. And we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooter shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servants Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. <clears throat> Talking today about the time when kings go forth into battle. The time when kings go forth unto battle. Now, 
There is in the Christian life an importance of maintaining a proper and consistent manner. Okay? The Christian life, often people say, is, is a marathon, it's not a sprint. When you're sprinting, it's, it's, it's all your bursts of energy at once to get to the finish line that's close to you as fast as possible. There's not much calculation to it. You just go as fast as you can. You've got a short amount of time. You expel all your energy and you get there. The Christian life isn't that way. For many it is, and they are the ones that come. They show up to church and they, they start soul winning and they start reading their Bible. And within a few years at most, they tend to fall away and, and just go back to their ways. That would be the sprinting Christianity. But, but consistency comes and endurance comes with some preparation and some careful thought and some, some planning as, as you go about to finish the course. And so therefore, Christians, I believe, it's, it's so important that we maintain a proper and regimented and consistent manner in our ways. As men, we're creatures of habit. And we all know this. As our, as our routine has fallen away in these last few weeks, Sometimes I'm sure we found ourselves wondering what to do. I think sometimes we fall, we, we, we lose track of even what day it is. And, or, or, or we sleep in through something that we shouldn't have. Or we miss something else that we shouldn't have. And our, our routines have fallen apart. And we're very uncomfortable that way. Uh, I think humans react best when, when we have a habit, when we have a routine, when we have a consistent manner. And that translates, of course, over to the Christian life. Not just a general term. Now... You can go over to Luke chapter 2 in the New Testament. Luke chapter 2. We're talking about the time when kings go forth. We see very clearly that there was a specific time when kings were to go forth unto battle. As was recorded in the scriptures we just read. In Luke chapter 2 we find our Lord Jesus in the early portion of his life. Luke chapter 2 and in verse 42 the Bible says, And when he was twelve years old, Old. So he's just a, a young man, right? He's about to become what we call a teenager, right? Adulthood is upon him. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So we see that Jesus already had a custom that was given by the government to go to the feast, right? God overseeing that government that he gave to the people of Israel specifically was that there was a feast coming. And so he went to that at that time when he was 12 years old. Verse 43, when he had fulfilled the days, as they returned the child, Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answered. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And so here Jesus indicates, and it's indicated, shown to us in the scriptures, that from a very young age, from the age of 12, he had a manner that was after the business of his father. He asks his, his, his mother and Joseph, How is it that ye sought me? Why was it so shocking you didn't have me? Wist ye not? Did you not realize? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? That was the manner of our Savior, was that even from a young age, he had devoted himself and dedicated himself and, and thoroughly set his mind to be about the father's business. And this, we know, continued on right into adulthood. Jesus said later on in, in the Gospels, I must work the works of him that sent me. While, is it, while it is yet day, the night cometh when no man can work. And so Jesus carried that right through into adulthood. Late in his ministry, he was still working the works of the Father. After the manner of the Father. <laughs> after the business of the Father. He was consistent. He was steadfast. He maintained that proper manner, that habit, that routine before his God. He's determined to finish, and we need to be as well. We need to have a manner. We need to have a way about it, and so we need to be determined to finish in that manner. 
If you're not consistent in your Bible reading, if you're not consistent in your prayer, if you're not consistent in your church attendance, if you're not consistent in speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and all of these things that are attributes of the Christian life, if you're not consistent in reaching and preaching the gospel to the lost, you need to develop a manner now and commit yourself to maintaining that well into the future. We must be determined to finish strong. We must set consistent habits now that become a routine that just become our manner, our way of living life now and be determined to carry that on well into the future. Go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. It's so important, especially you young children here, you, you young adults here, to, to now set yourself as Christ did when he was 12 years old, to be about the Father's business, to be about the things that are important in this life, to be about the things of God. Set yourselves. Get that routine going. Get that habit going. Make that habit just your way. That's how you live. That's how you walk. That's how you breathe every single day. This is your manner. The Father's business being paramount. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is extremely important today. Look at this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And here we are in these last days, these perilous times have come upon us, and these Character traits aren't just reserved for the unbelievers. These are things that Christians can take part in. You need to have a manner that is opposite of all these things. Otherwise, from such turn away. The godly man will turn away from the proud, will turn away from the blasphemer, the disobedient to their parents, those unthankful, those unholy, those without natural affection, false accusers, incontinent, all of these traitors, high-minded lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, need to be turned away from. You don't want to have the people of God turning their backs on you because you carry these character traits. Now you need to develop a routine and a manner that is opposite of these things. Don't love your own self. Love others. Don't be covetous. Be content. Don't be a boaster. Don't be proud, but rather be humble. A blasphemer? No. Mind your tongue. Disobedient to parents? No. Be obedient to the authorities that you are placed under, yielding always unto the higher. Children, Parents are above you. Above your parents is your parents' employers. Above them is the holy book of God, right? We all have these things in their proper order. We need to understand that, that that's how we need to live our lives, yielding unto these things. Don't be a traitor. Be someone that's faithful to your friends. Don't be high-minded. Be, be of lowliness of mind. Love God more than the pleasures of this life because the pleasures of this life are fleeting we're going to all have to learn a hard lesson to not be covetous nor to love pleasures as some of these things get pulled away from us that we're not going into easier times of, of more reward and more things that we can love more pleasures that we we're going into simpler days things are going to be a little bit different going forward we need to learn to be content with such things as we have, and give our love to God more than to the temporal things of this life. If you continue on in verse 8, it says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast Fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Paul says here, hey, Timothy, you have fully known my manner. Follow after it. You've fully known how I have faith and purpose in my life. Long-suffering in this walk. Charity towards others. Follow after these things. Verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life. Verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which always come from that, when 
which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And what's the truth that we can get from that is that the person that has that manner of being patient, of having purpose, of being full of faith, long-suffering, of being charitable, of is one that will face persecutions, is one that will face afflictions, it's one that will need to turn away from the ungodly of this world, but God will take them through all these things. What persecutions I endured, the Apostle Paul says, he's out of the, these all the Lord has delivered me. Verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's the double-edged blade. You live godly, you suffer. You live <laughs> godly, you suffer. But why would you want to have it any way, other way? You want to be grouped among those that that are, are, are being turned away from by the people of God? No, you want to be in the people of God, living godly, so that God can there for care for you in these times. Go down to verse 15, and it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He says, From a child you have known these things. He, he says, you've been taught these things by your grandmother. You've been taught these things by your parents. You've been taught these things from the Word of God, from the Holy Scriptures. You've known these things. Now what does the Apostle charge Timothy to do? Go back in verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. First and foremost, your parents have shown you a man. First, uh, after that, perhaps your preacher has shown you a manner. After that, perhaps some of us have godly grandparents that sh have shown us a manner. Regardless of all those people that have shown things to them, we have above all of these things the scriptures that give us a manner for godly living. Follow after these things. Continue in them is what the Apostle Paul here is encouraging. Now, if we were to go back to the scriptures that we originally read, we have David, a man after God's own heart. The king of Israel, who had been through great battles with God, had, had seen God's provision, had wrote so many psalms and hymns about God's care and provision for him. <laughs> Victories were fought with the hand of God upon him. David knew better. He had literally wrote scriptures. And yet, the man that did know better did not continue in these things. Here Timothy is, is said, you have of a child known these things, but continue, okay? So that indicates that just because you know the manner that you ought to live doesn't mean you're going to, uh, by default, continue in these things. You need to force yourself. You need to bear down. You need to be determined. You need to pray to God. You need to ask. You need to, you need to seek the mind of Christ in all things so that you can continue in the things that you have learned from a child. And David fell away from this. And why did he fall away from this? Because at the time when kings go forth into battle, David chose rather to hang out at home. There was a manner of things where consistently, time and time again, a routine that it is time for kings to go to battle. It is time for kings to get into a fight. It is time for kings to lead some troops. And David pushed back and stayed at home. For whatever reason he had, it wasn't good enough to break from his manner. At the time when kings go forth, that's the time when kings need to go forth. And what happened to David? He stayed back. The Bible says that he woke up in the middle of the night, walked up onto his roof, and a whole slew of trouble happened unto him because he had made the decision to break from the routine, to break from the example that was set forth even by himself in his younger days. See, Christ had a manner when he was 12, and he carried that right through. I must be about my father's business. And later on, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me. That's saying the same thing there. David was one that was always, the Lord is my shepherd. He's leading me. I'm a man after God's <laughs> own heart. And yet later on in his life, he broke from the routine and therefore fell. At the time when kings go forth unto battle, he decided and chose not to. And what happened was he gave place to the devil to tempt him, lust. When it is conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And it wasn't David's death, he was spared from it, but somebody died as a result of his sin. And not just one somebody, but that child died as well. 
We find out later on in the scriptures. The child that was conceived and the husband of the woman that it was conceived in died. Now, regarding going forth unto battle, okay, are there exemptions that are made in the scriptures? Okay, let's look at some. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 33, okay? Can somebody be exempt from going forth into battle? We're specifically talking about kings, King David, going forth into battle. Are there exemptions made? Genesis chapter 33, I believe, is one. If you are tender and young, you are exempt from going forth unto battle. Genesis 33 and in verse 12. And he said, Let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and the herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. So here by type of just a journey being made, we see an exemption made for the people, the children, the, the women who are tender and young, the flocks that need to follow after those. Now, these need a king or a leader or somebody to lead on, and that's what we see in the scriptures here. In verse 15, it says, And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. He is giving provision for protection for them, because these that are tender, these that are young, cannot defend themselves. They can't even keep up in the walking or in the, in the journey. So they have to slow down. They need somebody to lead them on softly. And they need protection from any danger that might come. Even so, as these need reinforcements, we can apply that to our daily life. People don't need to go to battle that are young and tender. Right? So David at this time wasn't young and tender, was he? He was a king, he was grown, he was nourished up in these things. But these that are young and tender, why are they exempt from the battle? Because they're still growing, they're still learning. They're still getting to the point where they can even go on to the battle, keep up with the footmen. And so exemptions for going to battle if you're young, if you're tender, of course. Now faintness, 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Faintness is another reason that someone would be exempt from the battle. And we saw there that the exemption wasn't necessarily for the strong, for the men, for the for the leaders. The exemption was made for the young and tender alone. First Samuel chapter 30, by reason of faintness, one might be excluded from going to the battle. First Samuel chapter 30. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. And David and the people that were with him lift up their voice and wept until they had no more voice to weep. And so those that were tender and young and the women were left behind in a city and that city was overtaken and smitten because they were not strong for the battle, of course. So when that was smitten, the city burned, all of them were taken captives by their captors at that time. There's a great mourning, a great weeping that falls among David and his men. But they're not going to leave it there. Verse 6 it says, And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And here's a good picture of David from yesteryear, where he encourages himself in the things of God. He motivates himself in the word and in the Psalms and in the things that the Lord is speaking to him of. He knows that God's promises are true and he's going to overcome what's going to happen and what has happened by them. If you read in verse 9, it says, So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not, over the, they could not go over the brook Besor. And so perhaps from the battles that had previously happened, and perhaps partially from weeping and mourning until there was no power to do so, 200 of the 600 men stayed back. Now, 
You can be exempt from battle, is showing here. Even the strong, if they are too weak, if they are too faint, if they've just been battling and raging too much and, and trying, to, trying to get after things and trying to do many works and, and they're just too tired, they're exempt from doing it. They can, they can stay home. If you're too tired for the battle, fair enough. Admit so and stay home. Verse 17, it says, And David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. Verse 17 shows that a battle all night was what was raging. And so, of course, if these are too weak to even cross over a river, they're not going to be in any kind of shape to fight from twilight until even. And so that was left to the 400, and some stayed back. It says in verse 18 that he recovered all, including his wives. Verse 19, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoiled nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they had drained before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. Now, continuing to read in verse 21, we see, and David came to the 200 men, these were too faint, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people which were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered, all the wicked men, the men of Belial, of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children, that he may, lay, that he may lead them away and depart. Then David said, ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as is his part that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance forever in Israel unto this day. Now, if you're too weak to go to the battle, of course, stay home. And, 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 and David shows this, saying and given by ordinance that, hey, they're just as much a part of the battle as us who went. Just because they could not have the strength, they didn't have the energy to go and down and do the fight from twilight to evening, they are included in reaping of what God has bestowed upon us. But looking at David's situation, was he so tired that he couldn't go into the battle? No, he was the king of Israel, and it was the time when kings should go forth unto battle. But David decided to stay back, and we know he wasn't tired because the very next verse, verse 2, says he arose from his bed at night and then went up onto the roof, and that's where he beheld Bathsheba from that roof. Somebody that is so faint and so tired that they can't go to the battle, even cross over a river to arrive at the battle, somebody that's in that state does not wake up in the middle of the night and walk around on the roof. See, so David has shown that he had fallen into the trap of being lazy and sedentary and, and he wasn't getting anything done. He wasn't working hard enough. Because I don't know about you, when I work hard, I fall asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow. And, and a king that was out in the battles would have done the same. He would have, he would have fallen asleep the moment that he got in from doing his toilet slavery. So that exemption, while it's granted unto people and discharge, an honorable discharge even, where they could still reap reward, that was preserved for those that are faint, but they would essentially have to show themselves to be faint, to be exempt. Now, another one is Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Who else is excluded from going to the battle? Faintness was an honorable discharge. They could receive of the reward of any spoils that came. An ordinance was made in Israel from that day forward. Fear is the next one. Judges chapter 7. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into thine hand. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful 
and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. This would be a dishonorable discharge. The God doesn't look highly on, on fear. But the thing is, is that fear, I believe, is contagious. When somebody's afraid, they start showing their fear and murmuring about their fear and explaining their fear and, and, and sucking other people into their fear. And so God recognized, hey, there's too many for you to get glory and you're just going to come into problems with the fearful, the unbelieving, those that have no faith. And so dishonorably, he said, these need to stay home. And it was a great amount of that camp that was overcome by fear instead of walking in faith with God. Now, it continues on in this parable, and he's going to whittle it down a little bit for, more to see who is exempt from the fight. And the Lord said in verse 4, unto Gideon, the people are yet too many, bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. And here, by manner and by God's preference and selection, he decides out of this group that there will be 300 that will go. And it is varying depending on how they take the water, whether they go down on their knees or whether they lap it up like a dog and they bring it to their mouth. But originally fear widowed down a large percentage of these. These were just knocked right out of the battle. No hope of coming, exempt from it, but not righteously so. Fear, being afraid of going to the battle, is never going to uh, relieve a king of his duties. So exemption for the battle. If you're tender and you're young, okay, you don't need to get into the fight. Okay, if you're so faint that you can't even cross over to get to the battle, okay, stay home. If you're afraid, uh, we don't want you in the battle anyways. Go home, right? So this is what is being uh, shown as exemptions for the battle. But in all of these, I see for a king, for a ruler, for a leader, there is no exemption for not getting involved in the battle. At the time when the kings go, they must go. David wasn't given any kind of clearance or any kind of leeway through these examples of why or an excuse as to why he couldn't go and take part in that fight. Now, because David did not what was according to the manner before, the manner of kings going to the battle, the manner that he had, he had always, year after year, gotten involved in, because he didn't do it, because he broke from his manner, and this is why I say that, that consistency is so important, because he broke from the routine, he sinned in the flesh, didn't he? He was overcome by lust. Not only that, right? His laziness brought him to a point where he's up in the middle of the night. He sees something with the eyes. And lust conceived in his heart and became a sin of the flesh. Not only that, he lied. He, he deceived to cover up. He, he tried to get Uriah to go lay with his own wife to cover up the great sin that he had done. He even murdered. The Bible says that that um, when Nathan confronted David, now his sword didn't touch Uriah the Hittite, but he gave the command to set him in the heat of the battle, withdrew the men from them, so that he was vulnerable and able to be destroyed. And when Nathan came to David, he said, Thou art the man. You're the murderer. You're the one that killed Uriah the Hittite in this case. But not only did he sin in the flesh and get involved in lying and murder somebody, he came to spiritual ruin. When at the end of all of these things, it was said, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And as a young child, I mean, you probably remember growing up, your parents being angry at you, punishing you, that was one thing. But almost the worst thing that could ever happen to you as a child, to your parents, was if they were just like, I'm not even going to punish you, I'm just disappointed. Like that was the worst. That was like crushing to have your parents just, just disappointed in you. You're almost like, please punish me. Please please ground me or give me spanking or something. But if they're just disappointed, that's, that's worse. That, that indicates a, a separation has taken place. And God here indicates that he was displeased with what David did. He, he, he didn't want nothing to do with that. He, he said, you were a man after my own heart. Why did you fall? And you know why David fell? Because he broke from the routine. He ceased to be a consistent believer. And this is why routine is so important. This is why I believe church is so important. I want the doors open because I want Christians to keep their routine going. Because if we break our routine, we'll end up like David. Up in the middle of the night, 
wandering around, looking about, getting ourselves in sins of the flesh, getting into trouble. Next thing you know, we're covering for our sins. This is what happens when people break from the Christian life and the routine of it all. I believe by shutting the doors, so many Christians are being forced to sin. I'm hearing it all the time of those that want to go to church and want to assemble with God's people and want to get the spiritual nourishment and want to get the fellowship, and yet the doors have been shut out. And so they're being, dis they're being closed off from having the assembling of ourselves together. They're joining up with the manner of some, right? Also, because they don't have the encouragement and the edification and, and God's people praying together and, and the, the accountability that comes with meeting with God's people, because they don't have that, they fall into even more sins and more trouble just besets them. They've broken from their routine. They always say that the, the, the Christian life is like fivefold. What is it? Like pray, read your Bible, soul win, go to church and tithe, right? Well, if we just take away church, now, now you, you've got one of the five broken down. You know what's going to happen? Church is gone. Soon you don't have a group to go soul winning with. And then after that, there's really no reason to read your Bible because you haven't heard a good personal sermon that drew you in to hear more from God. You, you don't have a place to tithe because we're to bring it to the storehouse, the Bible says. It's really not the same to send it by, by the internet, which is what they've all been, been driven to do. And then why would you, why would you talk to God if, if he's not talking to you through his word? And the whole Christian life falls apart, and next thing you know, sin enters in, and lust is taken that direction, and then sin bringeth forth death in the end. Death in the life of the Christian. Faith without works is dead. You can believe and go to heaven all day long, but if you don't have works, you're a dead Christian. This is the problem that David ran into. He ended up in, in a state of God being displeased with him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Doesn't that tell you that David was also in a, in a rut of unbelief? If he doesn't go into the battle, maybe it's just because he's doubting whether God's even going to help him in that battle. Who knows what was going through his mind when he made that decision? Now, as believers who have set themselves and decided and, 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 and said, hey, I'm getting in the battle, when, when, when it's the time that kings and priests, which we all are, are to go into battle, I'm going to be there. Someone that's resolved to be in church. Someone that's resolved to go and preach to the law. Someone that's resolved to pray and read their Bible and, 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 and give the tithe back to the Lord. It's somebody that's resolved to just, just stay in the fight and be in that manner, be about the Father's business. What do they need? What, what do they need to be battle ready? Well, first they need armor. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Leaving aside David, I'm sure people for for centuries have been picking on him in that scenario. I'm sure he regrets it. He's repented. The Bible records that. I think it's Psalm 51. That great, that great, you know, return unto me the joy of thy spirit. He said he didn't lose the Holy Spirit, but but the joy that comes from having fellowship with God. He he wanted that to be restored unto him. And David did. He he made restoration. He lived out his life in the end and in in, in, in the, the maybe not the former glory, but 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 he, he moved on from that time. So if we are going to be in the battle, what do we need? We need armor. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, and it continues, we see these things that we're wrestling against. It goes back to the example we gave about Satan and Leviathan. This is something that we can't overcome of our own selves. So we need spiritual, serious protection from these things. We need that whole armor of God if we are going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If young men are going to be able to stand against the Bathshebas on the roof. If young men are going to stand against the temptations to not get involved in the consistent Christian life. We need the whole armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. Not only the, his wiles, but it shows here that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Some of us are stronger than others, and we might be able to stand up to a fight against flesh and blood. But it's clear that the Christian's battle is beyond that. We're fighting against things that we cannot overcome of our own selves. We cannot overcome principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of the darkness of this world. All of these things that we're starting to see manifesting in our governments, we can't overcome them because it's not just 
the Trudeaus. It's not just the Trumps. It's not just these people that we see as the faces that are our enemies. It's the spirits that are manipulating them. And so we need, in a spiritual battle, a spiritual armor if we're going to go into a battle. It says in verse 12, we, or verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. In other words, being buckled down, having everything, having everything attached. Girding about with truth. Having your loins held up by that thing, you know? Your britches will fall down if you don't have a good belt on. You'll be embarrassed if you don't have the truth in your life. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, protecting your heart, your righteousness. What you, what you believe and receive righteousness by believing in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. And that's where you need to protect yourself, your heart, your breastplate, and God gives that to you. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, you've got shoes on that are ready to go and bring the gospel. Shod with that preparation. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Faith is going to protect you from attacks of the enemy from afar. Our faith wavers when we see and hear news from afar. And if we have a shield to protect ourselves from these things, we are much less for the wear in the Christian life. And take the helmet of salvation. In other words, the mind of Christ, the mind of the Spirit, protecting your head, your thoughts, and, and, and the sword of the Spirit, the Bible says, which is the Word of God. And so when you have all of these things together, coupled with verse 18, where it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there, too, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, when you're fully armored, you're fully protected, and you're fully ready for the battle that is ahead of you. And that's key. The battle is ahead of you. Notice in this, we don't have a back plate of anything, okay? So the thing that you need to understand about the spiritual armor that God gives us is it's an offensive armor. Christians shouldn't be retreating. Christians shouldn't be backing against, backing away from the gates of hell. We need to attack them. We need to come at them. We need to go after the enemy. We need to be facing the enemy head on and not turning back. There's no retreat in the Christian life. There's also, though, the risk of friendly fire. And we've all experienced a little bit of that, haven't we? When your back's exposed, unfortunately, the only people that can hit you and hurt you are friendlies. Okay? And so quite often in times like these, when things get struggles and, and trials and tribulations and persecutions are set before us, the people that are going to hurt us the most are the people that are behind us. Or at least we thought they were behind us and they're on our side. That's the problem that we face. They may be behind us. I got your back, man. Yeah, they might be ready to shoot it. Okay? So the thing is, is we're always going to face this in the Christian life. But if we're facing an enemy, the enemy can't overcome us. The enemy can never cause us to fall. We're completely protected if we're putting on the armor of God. When you're going to battle, when you've set yourself to be battle ready and battle prepared, you make sure that the armor is on you. Put it on every day. Meditate upon a scripture like this. It's a good one to memorize. Next thing that you need is a sharp sword. Go to Ecclesiastes 10. The Bible says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But the thing is, is that while that sword is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the biting asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrows, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, while it is all those things and sharp, it's always not sharp in our lives. We need a sharpened sword. And how do we keep it sharpened? We need to keep in the word. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 10, it says, If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. So wet there means sharpen. If the iron is blunt, if it's not sharpened, if the sword is dull and it is not sharpened, you know what it takes to use that sword? More strength. You need to put more strength into using that sword. But if it's sharp, if it's wetted, it'll glide right through the enemy, won't it? It'll cut right through those things. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Take a knife in the kitchen, and it's dull, and it's not really working. It's not cutting the chicken. It's kind of just like squishing it and moving it aside. You sharpen that thing, it'll glide right through it, won't it? Why? Because that's what a purpose of a blade is. It needs to be wet. Otherwise, you need to put more strength into it. It needs to be sharpened. So we need a sharp sword in the Christian life. We need God's word to be sharp in our life. His word is always sharp. 
It's perfect, right? But if we're not in it, if we're not learning from it, if we're not reading it, if we're not studying it, if we're not, if we're not being mindful of the scriptures, if we're not meditating upon these scriptures, it will become dull in your spiritual life. And when your spiritual sword is dull, you got to put more strength into getting anything spiritual done. Have we experienced that when you when you start to kind of like pull back from reading your Bible, you start to do less prayer, you start to go soul winning less. The next time you go back to do that thing, it's hard, right? I haven't read my Bible in three weeks. I'm going to pick this thing up, and it's like, it's hard. It takes strength to get through that. What about I haven't been soul winning for a month? I'm going to go out, I'm going to knock some doors. Man, that first door is, is just getting to that door is difficult. It takes more strength if you don't have a sharp sword on your side. I like this because it likens it to wisdom. It says there, the last portion there, it says, but wisdom is profitable to direct. You can go a few pages over to Proverbs chapter 4 regarding wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4. Wisdom, it says, is profitable to direct. Wisdom is profitable to direct. Proverbs 4 and verse 7, it says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting... Get understanding. Wisdom is the principle, the primary, the most important thing. And we need to get more of it. So that sharp sword is likened unto having wisdom. It's profitable to direct. But if it's not sharp, if it's not present, if it's not ready, if it's not been wet properly, then it is more strength that is required to actually get anything done with it. We need wisdom. We need to be wise, especially in these days. That is the principal thing. And where do we get wisdom? Where do we get understanding? We get it from the very words of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise instruction. Where are we going to get wisdom from? Fearing God and going to his word and letting him speak to us. That's how we sharpen our sword, and that's how we're prepared unto battle. We need to have the cadence in the Christian life. When kings go to battle, we need to be ready to go to battle. When Christians go soul winning, we need to be ready to go soul winning. When we go to, need to go to church, at the time when Salwar's Baptist goes to church, we need to go to church, right? At that appointed time, we need to stay consistent. Otherwise, what happens to us is we end up falling from these things. And before we know it, we're like David, disappointing our God. Next thing we need, we need armor, we need a sharp sword, we need strength. Now, our strength will be much more effective and efficient if we are keeping the sword sharp. If we have the armor to help us out, we, we need strength. Even in, that, even in that passage about the armor, it said, it said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. So our strength is coupled with the armor. The armor helps you to be strong. Right? Where you are weak, then are you strong? You may be a little tender in some spots. Your head, right? It's vulnerable until you put on the armor. You become stronger when you're emboldened with the word of God and with all of those armor portions that he's allotted to the believer. You become even more strong than you are. But we need to have strength in and of ourselves that comes from the spirit of God. But it's not just strength for a moment. Have you ever seen these... These weightlifters that they're really big and they're really ripped and they can lift the barbell as it's bending over their heads one time and then they drop it, right? They've got strength, but it's not sustained. That guy couldn't do half the weight for 20 repetitions, right? He would, he would not be able to endure such a thing. The Christian strength is just like how we run the Christian race. It's not all of the energy expelled in a moment. It's prolonged. It's sustained. That's what our strength is. If you would, you can go to Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. The Christian life is an endurance race. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5 talks about this. Jeremiah 12 verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen... And they have wearied thee? How canst thou contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? And this scripture is indicating that if you're going to run an endurance race with horses, you need to first contend with the horsemen. 
we were discussing, my wife and I, about, about this because it, it came immediately to my mind. Everybody that, that closed up church broke from their routine and, and just said, it's only for two weeks, so it's okay. It came into, immediately to my mind, what do you do? When do you decide that it's going to be? I knew it wouldn't be two weeks. I don't know how they missed it, but you had to have known. <laughs> okay, so they say, oh, it's going to be two weeks, but here we are at, like, what, four, going on five, okay, of shutting down the churches voluntarily, okay? How did they not know it would be longer? And, and when do you decide, okay, now it's time to turn on? I don't think those churches will ever be the same. I think there's a lot of people that have fallen away and they're gone into sin and, and turned from the things of God. There's a lot of people that want to be in church, but they can't. They're frustrated. They're jaded, right? They're going to come back maybe with that attitude. There's a lot of people that are just, just, just out of the fight, giving up. I want nothing to do with this. There's a lot of people that in the time when kings go to battle, in the time when churches go to church, they instead are up on their rooftop falling into sin because church is closed. There's no battle, right? There's nothing prepared for them, okay? So I thought to myself, this, when do you kick it on? Even if you do, these are behind, okay? Because here's what happens. I did an endurance race where I got up to being able to do 100 miles on the bike, okay? But I didn't go from nothing to 100 miles just in a day, okay? I didn't even go from nothing to 50 miles, on the bike. Uh, the first ride, ride was maybe five miles, and that was hard, okay? So it was one of these slow ramp ups, okay? I, I, I worked my way a few miles at a time to getting to the point. That's endurance. You need to start small and get up there, right? You wanna do a thousand push ups in a row, okay? You gotta start with one. Now, here's what we're gonna have, and this is the problem. If thou if thou was wearied by the footman, how canst you contend with horses? But if you were able to work your way up to the footman, it's going to be a lot easier to get to the horses, is it not? Because you've balanced it. You've stretched out the, the time. So if you've gotten, maybe in, in 10 weeks, you've got to run with horses. And, and humans can do that, believe it or not. There's races over in Europe where, where men actually beat horses in a foot race. Because horses don't have very good endurance compared to men. They can run and run and run and run. We've got to build our way up there. So we're going to have a whole bunch of Christians who have been out of the fight, out of the race, not prepared, not working, not getting after the things of God. And then they were, ex they were expecting that after two weeks they would turn it on. Well, now you have somebody that's essentially in my 100-mile race picture. They went from instead of 0 to 5 to 10 to 15 to 20. You've got somebody that now has to go from 0 to 20. They're not going to make it. They're not going to make the race. Now, what if church is closed for four weeks? Now you got somebody that's zero, 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 zero on the fourth week. They're expected, if they're following the curve of endurance and getting up to that point on 10 weeks, they're expected to, after four weeks, go up to 40 miles overnight. From zero to 40, just like that. You need to be able to run with the footmen if you expect to contend with the horses. In other words, you need to start small before you can get up to the big challenge. And now we have a world of Christian churches out there who are just sitting on their hands, not doing anything for God. And at some point, believers are going to have to make the decision that, okay, enough is enough. I'm getting spiritual. They're going to get up. They're going to change out of their track pants, brush the chips off their chest. They'll have a gut sticking out to here, spiritually speaking. They're like, all right, where's the battle? What's going to happen? They're going to fall by the sword. They will not be able to endure the fight. They will not be able to contend even with the footmen. They'll be wearied by them, and then the horses will overtake them. The second part, in the land of peace. If in the land of peace whereon thou trustest, you're wearied. If when, when it was peaceful in this nation, it was hard to go to church. It was hard to get in your Bible. It was hard to love your neighbor as yourself. It was hard to live a Christian life. If it was hard then when it's peaceful, now when the swelling of Jordan, now when the floods are coming, now when the things are falling apart, now when everyone's fighting against you, you think people are going to just overnight be like, yeah, I can do this. I'm going to get into the fight now. No. It will be overcome and overtaken in a moment. But those that have prepared themselves unto the battle and are ready for what's to come, seeing it aforetime, and now are setting their manners, now have a, a way about them, now they're following after the Father's business, it's going to be so much easier for them once the horses come. 
Once you got to run with the horses, once you got to run with the big boys, once you got to go to battle, right? You're going to be ready for these things. Second Timothy, Second Timothy. We need strength for the long run. We need we need it to be be something that will last. We need to endure. Second Timothy, chapter two. Second Timothy, chapter two, and in verse one. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who also shall be able to teach, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, David displeased the Lord because he did not endure. He gave up. He stopped going to battle. He gave up on the fight. He decided to be stagnant for a couple weeks. And when the time came to overcome, when the time came to do what is right, when the time came to prove himself, it was a 40-miler, right? He went from sitting on his lazy bones to getting up, and the challenge came before him to set no evil thing before his eyes. Look away from the naked woman, and he couldn't even overcome that temptation. He was on a different roof. Do you realize the effort that he had to go through to have her come up to him and so that he could lie with her? It wasn't like... It was probably one of the easiest temptations you can imagine. All he had to do was, whoa, hey, no, and go back to bed, right? But it was like that race, right? He got to week four of sitting on his hands, and he couldn't withstand the footman. He couldn't withstand the 40 miles. He fell because of that, because of the challenge that was placed before him, the, the temptation. Now, this verse it says one thing that's interesting. Verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. And this is another thing that will suck your Christianity away from you. We got a lot more time on our hands that we should be allotting to the things of God. We should be giving God more of our lives and not less. But people are getting entangled in the affairs of this life. We're getting caught up, wrapped up, tripped up by the temptations and the wiles of the devil. Does anyone have any qualms about me saying that the media is of the devil? your politicians are of the devil this world is of the devil and go figure these are his wiles he's putting the news in front of you he's putting the fear in front of you he's putting the lies in front of you and Christians are just soaking it up if you're going to war do not entangle yourself in the things of this life the affairs of this life put them aside turn it off switch it off throw your TV out the window if you have to break that phone in pieces done I'm out of it okay it's like, the old, it's like the saying in the scriptures, it would be better to cut your hand off than to be hindered from the things of God, right? to be removed from it. It would be better for that man to cut his hand off than, than, to, than to have that temptation drag him into hell, into death. Don't be entangled with the things of this life. He says there, be strong, endure hardness, okay? Hardness, how do you endure hardness? You need to be harder than what's being pushed against you, okay? I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here right now and talk about engineering, okay? There's something called work hardening, okay? Two things, objects, that are rubbed together, the harder one will always cut into the softer one, okay? This is why we use ceramics and diamonds, very hard, to cut metals, okay? Because metals, by and large, even though it's hard on you, is not hard to a diamond, okay? So if I take a piece of metal and rub it against your arm, it's going to cut into you because obviously that metal's harder than your arm. If I take the diamond and rub it against the metal, the metal's going to be cut away because the diamond is harder than that. But there is this thing called work hardening. And this is why Christians need to be endurance runners, endurance walkers. In we need to be focused on enduring things. Endure hardness. How do you endure hardness? You need to be harder. I'm not talking being hard-hearted. I'm talking being, being prepared, being ready, being strong, right? Be stronger than the hardness that's coming at you in the form of the affairs of this life. Be, be stronger than the hardness that is coming at you by the people of this world that hate your guts. Be stronger than the temptations that are coming after you. Now... 
There's a thing in engineering called a stress strain curve. I'm going to try to demonstrate it a little bit. Now, stress on the vertical axis here is basically the deformation force relative the area unit. Okay, so that's how much strength is being put into the item. So as there's more strength, you also have strain on this bottom curve increasing as well. Strain is the apparent shape change. So as you add force, a material will change. It's pretty easy to look at an elastic, right? You hold it and it's this shape, and then as I add more stress, the shape changes, right? It gets longer, it gets thinner, okay? But there's this thing specifically in metals that, that hardens the object that is under stress. So elastic deformation happens in the first part of this thing. That means that I can take the metal, put a certain amount of stress on it, and it's elastic in that region. So if I let go of it, it will return back to where it's supposed to be. So you can stress something, it will return back. It'll stress something, it'll return back. It doesn't get any harder. The properties don't change on it. You just move it enough to kind of change the shape and then it returns back to it. This is most Christians. Most Christians will go through a little bit of stress and then they just kind of return back to normal and things go normal. They go through a little bit of stress and then they return. They're still in that elastic deformation stage. They will, for a moment, change shape and do things a little bit differently, behave a little differently, but ultimately, once the pressure comes off, they return back to normal. That's Christians, right? They never grow. But hardening happens once you take a metal past the point of elastic deformation and bring it to the plastic deformation phase. So this is what happens essentially once a metal gets pushed beyond that point that once you release it, it will stay there. And it will actually in the end be stronger than it was before. Work hardening happens when stress and strain increase to a point where subatomically and molecularly the item is actually changed. And here's how this works. <clears throat> when you take, let's say, a piece of Velcro and you flip it backwards, back to back, that's not the sticky part of it, right? You can slide it back and forth, it'll move this way and that, and it'll essentially, it'll go wherever you want it. At the elastic stage, that's what happens. You stretch these things, and then when you release them, they go back to normal. But when you bring a steel to a point where it is work hardened, it gets stronger when it's put to stress, when it's brought under strain, then what happens is essentially it behaves more like the other side of the Velcro. So as you pull it apart molecularly, you'll have the material break off, and then it becomes a different shape. So instead of these, these plates, these slip planes, being able to go back and forth and slide over one another as a stretching, essentially it'll actually change shape. And you'll have plate going this way and a plate going that way and a plate going this way. And so it'll be just like the Velcro that comes together. And now you can't slide it because it's, it's stayed in that portion. All that to say this, Christians need to be work hardened. And work hardening comes from over a time period or over a, a stress or over a length that is brought to it, you become stronger as more stress is put upon you and it changes you. Christians change and grow and they become stronger as more stress is put upon them and they yield themselves to it. Do you know what that point is called where it crosses over from elastic deformation into plastic deformation? If you follow that curve, that's called the yield point. That's the point where the Christian stops worrying about returning to their old ways. Stops worrying about things got hard, but oh man, I'm so glad it's back to normal. Oh, this was challenging, but oh, it's good. But once the Christian gets to the point where the stress enters their lives and they're willing to yield from it, God's able to pull us a little bit farther we're to the point where we've grown. We're stronger. How do you endure hardness? By being stronger than what's coming at you. And every time more comes at you, more stress, more stress, more stress, you become strained, you become elongated, you become different, but you become stronger. And then ultimately what happens is as you get to this point, comes to the end, you've been pulled, you've been stressed, you've been strained, and then boom, it's a failure falls the thing becomes zero in both directions no stress no strain on a broken part so what's the practical application i believe about that 
It's that pressure and stress will make the Christian stronger, okay? We need to be willing to yield ourselves to some troubles. Endure, you need to endure hardness by letting hardness come at you a little bit, okay? Endure it and go through it. Suffer these things. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So live godly so that you suffer more. That's how you yield yourself to God putting some pressure on you, putting some stress on you. The next thing that comes to realize out of this is that you have a lot of Christians that stay elastic. They stress, they return. They stress, they return. They stress, they return. And then eventually they just kind of fizzle out. And all but Christians need to burn out, not fade away. We need to burn out, not fade away. Just like the graph, just like the stress strain graph. We get to the point where it's enough, boom, we're gone. We're out of here. And if you look, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. That gives that idea of endurance, long-suffering, putting up with some things. What are you doing? In season, out of season, popular, not popular. Whether it's the time, when it's the time to go to kings, you go fight in battles as a king, you do it, right? In season, out of season, when things are hard, when things are easy, you get into it. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. See that sound doctrine is something that you got to endure? Endure hardness. When scripture comes at you, endure those things. You know how you endure it? You yield to it, just like the, just like the graph, right? You yield to it. It's amazing that God gives us physical things to represent spiritual truths. Yield to that thing. Endure sound doctrine. But they will not, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. But look at verse 7. Paul wasn't this way. In verse 7 he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also to them that love his appearing. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And you know what the Apostle Paul is here saying? I'm ready to burn out. I'm done. The fight's over. I fought it. The battle's over. I won it through Christ. I have kept the faith unto the end. He's saying he didn't fear. Persecutions came. Struggles came. Trials came. He endured them. And he was made stronger as a result. He endured them. And that work that God put into him made him a harder believer, a harder Christian, a stronger person that could, by faith, walk in the next challenge that God has for them. And the next challenge that God has for them. And the next challenge that God has for them until God's like, that's enough. Come home. And it's done. It's over with. Christians need to burn out. Don't be like David and fade away. Don't fall away from the challenges that are set before you. The next battle, the next war. Don't say, hey, I know it's the time that Christians ought to, but I'm going to stay home from this one. That, that's the first step unto fading away and falling into failure. You've, you've, you've made yourself elastic. You're just going to whip back to brand, the same spot. And this is what happens. This is why when, when we need a sharpened sword... And, and why it becomes dull. It's because we're elastic, right? We sharpen it. We work, we work, we work, and then we fall back. It just goes back to normal. But if we work to the point, allow God to work in our lives, and we endure the next challenge, the next challenge, the next struggle, next thing you know, God has brought us into the point where we're deformed. We are made in His image. We are formed more like the Son of God. We are changed. We are transformed. We are growing in the things of God, and He can use us for greater things because we can overcome the next challenge and the next challenge and the slightest things won't knock us on our tail the littlest temptation won't run us through the mud we won't fall and succumb to the little things that we would have before earlier in our days but we got to yield to god let him stress us out a little bit let him let him put us through some trials let him make us harder so that we can endure hardness we can overcome when we are faced with but the Bible teaches, hey, David, at the time when he was supposed to go forward and do what was right, he stayed home instead. And his testimony suffered, and people in his life suffered, and it was brought to ruin, and the worst thing ever, he made God disappointed in him. We don't want to be like that. We don't, we don't, we don't want to let God down. 
We don't want to let our families down. We don't want to, we don't want to ruin things for other people in our lives. So what do we do? When it's the time to run the race, accept the challenge. Contend with the footman today so that we'll be prepared for the horse. Endure hardness today so that we can face harder challenges to come. And I promise you, the harder challenges are coming. So let's get in the fight now. Get a manner down. Get consistent in it. Stick with it. We can be part of a group that's going to do great things, not part of the group that sits home. <clears throat> let's everybody else fight for us. All right? Amen. Thank you, Father, for this.